What's really been going on with the NC State offense? Is it too many cooks in the kitchen or just one cook that needs to turn on the oven? You are Locked On Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Wolfpack Nation? It's time to get locked in with Locked On. Thanks for making Locked On Wolfpack your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's Tuesday sponsor is FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. Head on over to FanDuel.com in order to get started. Happy Tuesday to all. As always, I'm Grayson Boone. Joined by former Wolfpack defensive tackle Kenton Gibbs. Kenton, we're going to talk a lot about the NC State football offense here on Tuesday. We talked a lot on Saturday and on Monday about how it was good enough. C.J. Bailey is getting a little bit better every single week. In fact, C.J. Bailey was named ACC Rookie of the Week. Very well-deserved honor for his performance out at Cal. But the offense is still sputtering. And it seems like the, the best moments of our offense are kind of born out of desperation. Whether that's late in the Syracuse game, late in this game on the road at Cal, it seems like we're only really able to establish something consistent when it's third and long or fourth and long or it's late in the game in the fourth quarter. Why does that keep happening to us? You know, I love this man. Again, got his phone number. He's the reason I'm in the state of North Carolina. But I... I'm inclined to believe his story. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. If there's a problem, Grayson, let's say you move into one apartment and you're like, damn, this apartment has fruit flies. I'm inclined to believe, oh man, that's just a bad apartment, man. They just got, they got some pests going on in there. Benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And then you move into a town and you're like, man, this thing got fruit flies in it. A little suspicious that two places in a row have like a bad fruit fly thing going on, but you're my man. I'm going to assume you are right. And then you move into the third different space and you like fruit flies every. Damn it, you just dirty. It's you. It's you. There's a common denominator in all three places and it ain't the fruit flies. It, it, it's, or actually, it is the fruit fly, but there's another common denominator. It's you. It's you. You may not live in the same area. You may not do the same. I say that to say, I, when I go back and think about our offense over the years, I go back to the OG days when I was there. Do you remember who the offense coordinator was when I was there? Is it Matt Canada? Matt Canada. And do you remember what people's biggest gripe was with Matt Canada? He wasn't any good. <laughs> well, yes, that. But <laughs> what specific play type were people saying, please stop running this? The screens? It was screens. And then you go from Matt Canada to Eli Drinkwitz. Hey, drink cook. Yeah, you know what I mean? Hey, drink that got the most out of what he got. He's a reason that his next job was a head coaching job. Drink absolutely cook. Do you remember who was after drink? The dual offensive coordinating gig? Yes, it was Dez Kitchings and uh, right. George McDonald. I think so. I think that's that was the situation. And that that experiment didn't last long enough for there to be like a a meaningful like, oh, this is a good sample size of what this is. But do you remember who the next sole offensive coordinator was? Tim Beck. Yeah. And do you remember what everybody's biggest problem was with Tim Beck? Screens and lack of a running game. And quarterback draws. Screens and quarterback draws. And now we are here with who replaces Tim Beck after he goes on to become the head coach of Coastal Carolina? Mr. Robert and I. And what's the problem? The damn fruit flies have traveled across three different coordinators. I'm inclined to believe that there is something going on where it's like, hey, these are all three very different guys that are running like very similar problematic things that are upsetting everybody. And I'm going to say this. I'm a firm believer that when it gets to the most like, hey, this is an emergency. We got to get it done. Folks are finally, to me, it's a lot like the difference between booking a vacation and getting out the house when everything is on fire because it's an emergency, right? When you leave for vacation, 
hey, let's make sure everything is put up nice. Let's make sure everything is put in the way that I want it to be, right? Because your goal isn't just get out of the house. It's create a house that's sustainable when you leave for the next however long. When a fire is going on and you're like, oh, oh, damn, the back of this door is very hot. Uh, I got to figure out a way out of this house. Your only goal is to get out as soon as possible. When we get in that mode of I need to score as soon as possible, to me, it becomes more feasible and it happens more often because it's no longer about the aesthetic or I want this thing in particular. I want that thing. You think, what what can get us down the field right now? Right now. I don't want to play around. I don't want to actually go. What gets us where we want to go as soon as possible? And that, to me, is why I'm like, you know. And, and even beyond that, we have been one guy away so many times. Too many times. I said on Locked on ACC earlier today that C.J. Bailey has made so many big-time throws where it's like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the receivers have been bad, but I'm saying if a guy makes an NFL catch, C.J. Bailey's stats look way different because we've seen a lot of passes where he he drops one in a place that only his receiver can catch it. It's going to be a tough catch, but only the receiver can catch it if we just drop it because, again, that ain't Ryan Williams who he's used to throwing to, right? But objectively speaking, I – and again – this is not an indictment of Dorn as no raw head coach. This isn't like, oh, I think you're terrible overall. But this is me saying, if I'm seeing something spread across all these people, you know, my mom used to tell me at Parenting's Conference, all these people ain't lying on you. And I think it's the, the a very similar way in that, you know, I'm seeing all these people say, or all of these coordinators run the same problematic thing. And that's, that's what I think is the problem. Something I remember that you've said on here in the past is that the team will often reflect the attitude and the temperament of the head coach. Coach Doran, the way he likes to win football games is kind of a, a slower, methodical, defensive, like slugfest type of game. If you put one to one together here, it's not so difficult to understand why the offense is slow, methodical, ugly at times, and then the defense is relied upon to go out and win the game. I don't think it's rocket science to figure out a lot of the reason the offense struggles is because that's the way that Coach Dorn wants to win a game. But when you're looking closer at the play calling and some of the personnel that's being used, that's where I begin to question Robert and I. And the two of us have been high on Robert and I over his short term here so far. What he did last year was spectacular, the way he utilized Casey Concepcion, who was the only weapon. We all know how that went. This year, it's been a complete train wreck so far for the offense. The run game a disaster. Nowhere to be found is the run game. Continually so. We'll touch more on that in just a second. But we harped on Saturday about the amount of times that C.J. Bailey is being asked to run, which is extremely head-scratching. He ran 15 times in this game. Now, not all of those are designed. Some of those are scrambles. Some of those are necessary. Yeah. Some of those are scrambles. Some of those are sacks. And some of those are necessary in in a sense where he has to get out of the pocket. When you're seeing quarterback draw on second and seven or third and 16 or third and eight, please somebody explain this to me like I am four years old. It makes not an iota of sense to me in any situation, really. Now, CJ Bailey, is he a dual threat quarterback? I think he has the capability of doing so. I don't think his field vision is at a point yet where you can repetitively ask him to go get you a first down or get you eight, nine yards. It's just not there yet. And, and he's so, not big enough. He's not big enough no. either. He's not built for, hey, you're that's a six foot five, 240 pot. Like, hey, that's a guy. That's a dude that can, you know, dump him up all game and he's just going right. to get back up. I'm good. I'm all right. No problem. I've seen on more than one occasion where it will be a QB draw. He'll take it. He'll hit the hole. And it will be relatively well blocked but then he'll run directly into the block and he picks up two yards, three yards, and the whole play is blown up. That's not, it's just his field vision and experience is just not at the level yet where you can repetitively call on him to use that play and expect success. It's just not one series in particular that come, that really comes to mind in this type of conversation. We, I think it was in the first quarter. We had drove down the field. We got within first and goal. I think we went like QB draw for like maybe one yard there's some kind of cute little shovel pass that shovel completely pass that got blown got up. Picked off. Immediately. Yeah. yeah, almost got picked off. Enough. Hammer it in the end zone. I don't care if you have to put Justin Jolie at tailback. Find a way to get it in the end zone. Some of this play calling is just so maddening to watch. And some of the personnel used in that same idea, it's complete nonsense. And so for a team that when we talked about this in the offseason – for a team that has lost some of their defensive stars, they might need the offense to carry a little bit more of the weight. 
I think you found out in real time that has to be the situation. Your offense does have to go out and ultimately win you these ball games. I think they did it on Saturday against Cal, despite the defense standing up in the fourth quarter. It's going to have to continue moving forward. When you have a young quarterback who's now building up that confidence and he can throw for 300 plus yards on the road, that has to be the formula. Do what works for your team. Do what works for your young quarterback. Spread the field, air it out, and enough with this cute, nonsensical QB draw nonsense. It just doesn't work. It hasn't all year. I couldn't agree more. I'm not going to argue with you at all. I, again, I just, I'm very tired of seeing uh, things that we, you and I have talked about this at nauseum. Stop doing what doesn't work and do what does. And as simple as that sounds, I mean, I feel like that shouldn't be too complicated. I feel like that's, that is one of those things where oftentimes coaches like to outthink themselves. Yes. Like, you know, and, and it's like, dude, you don't have to prove that you're the smartest guy in the room. Sometimes your Larry's and your Joe's are better than theirs. And you say, well, wait a minute now. I know that my Larry is better than your Larry. I'm going to just go with a very simple concept where your Larry's going to have to match up with that Larry one for one. And let's see what happens. Let's see how this works out for us. So, you know, I, I 100% agree that in certain aspects, it seems like we're scheming ourselves out of success. And a prime example of that, when Hollywood Smothers is your RB1 and he only has seven carries in a ball game. Something has gone wrong, and I think you know exactly where to look when something like that happens. Yeah. Coming up next, we're going to get into a whole lot of nothing or a whole lot of something after a quick word from our sponsors. Locked on Wolfpack listeners, it's time to recognize our Roy Player of the Week. So far this season, we've pulled over $20,000 to help support players on Roy. Micro deposits lead to massive change, and with the Roy app, you can direct your support to the athletes you love ensuring that all funds go to the specific player that you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season. The best part? It's risk-free. If the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver the content, you get all of your money back. This week, we're yet again supporting quarterback C.J. Bailey. I just pitched in $100, and I'd love for you to join me. Even $10 will make a difference. Let's show C.J. Bailey the love and support that keeps him connected to NC State. And remember, pay today, celebrate tomorrow. Your support sets your team up for success. Plus, don't miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway. You can win two tickets to any game in November by just downloading Roy, creating an account, and entering referral code Locked On. And just like that, you're entered. If you're already on Roy, any contribution to an athlete's campaign will also get you entered automatically. No purchase necessary and void where prohibited. Download Roy now and join the NIL game with no subscriptions and no fees. Be sure to check them out on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter at Roy underscore. Roy, support the players and change the game. Middle portion of our Tuesday show. Now time for a whole lot of nothing or a whole lot of something. Three topics. We'll tell you exactly where we stand on them. First one here. Saturday's 13-point comeback against Cal was actually the largest fourth-quarter comeback in the entire Dave Doran era. Whole lot of nothing, whole lot of something. Whole lot of something. This is a team that in multiple regards had every single indicator of, hey, this team's going to quit, right? You're looking at a team that has um, performed well below expectations. You're looking at a team that has – a situation where there seemed to be chemistry issues at some point in time from the outside looking in. You're looking at a team that is led by a young guy. The young guys are leading. And generally, when you look at that, young guys are much more likely to do the, why are we doing this? We're done here. Because the old guys know, uh, for a lot of them, this is the last time you'll ever play organized football. Right. That's it. Yeah, you know I mean, unless you want to go play 37U in some like rec league or, or you know, whatever the case may be. And by the way, those leagues are not insured, buddy. So uh, if you get hurt, congratulations. Hopefully we've donated enough to your Roy account for you to take care of that. But that's neither here nor there. In all seriousness, you know, it, it's normally like the older teams that have that resilience, have that bounce back, have that, you know what? We're never going to quit attitude. This team had all the indicators, and yet they got fighting, they got battling. And the biggest reason I said it's a whole lot nothing, the offense showed a level of explosiveness, which we had not seen to this point. There was instantaneous, hey, we know what to do to get us downfield. Now, here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. 
and you and I talked about the drives. We talked about, hey, this player tested, this player tested, this player tested. That's your recipe for success for the rest of the season. Force it to these guys in these ways. You'll be all right. Yes, it's definitely a whole lot of something. And Kenton, to your point, it, it's so inspiring when the team does go on the road and, and pulls off the largest fourth quarter comeback in this entire Dorn era. And they're doing that with a true freshman quarterback, with true yep. freshman wide receivers, with freshman defenders making differences on the defensive side of the ball. So many young pieces were the reason that you win this game on the road. Hollywood Smothers, redshirt freshman running back, game-winning touchdown. So mm-hmm. many important pieces to this team have been the younger guys, the freshmen, the sophomores, and some even true freshmen. If you want to build on momentum like that, this is how you do it. When you have younger guys in the game and they turn out to be the game-changing plays or game-changing players, just think about all the confidence that that builds around that young core to hopefully extrapolate into the next season. That is definitely a whole lot of something. There's a lot to be excited about. If you can maintain it all here in Raleigh, there is something cooking here on offense. It might take a little bit longer to get there, but you can already smell it in the air. It's a whole lot of something. Second one here, NC State won this road ACC game with just 29 yards rushing. A whole lot of nothing, a whole lot of something. A whole lot of something because you have to help C.J. Bailey out. Absolutely. I'm not saying you have to lead with the run, but the run has to be effective at some point in time. And I know that you talked earlier about, hey, uh, how many carries did you get from Hollywood Smothers? But let's take, let's completely take C.J. Bailey out of it, right? So we take away 15 of those rushes for negative seven yards. You're looking at 15 rushes for 36 yards. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's take away the one team rush as well, which was a negative one yard kneel down. You're looking at 14 rushes for 37 yards. That is good for under three yards a carry. Hollywood Smothers averaged 3.6. Kendrick Raphael, 1.7. KC, two. The longest run we had in the game was 18-yarder by Cedric Bailey. The longest run we had by a guy not named Cedric Bailey was an eight-yarder from Hollywood Smothers. We need to figure out something. Is it a lack of push? Is it a lack of creativity? Is Cal just that good against the run? I don't know, but this feels like a whole lot of something. It's definitely a whole lot of something. And we, when we spent so much time talking about an air raid offense, this is not how we meant it to look. Not struggling so much in the run that only your pass is effective. The formula for NC State should be to continue to spread the ball through the air because that's where you're finding your success. However, the run game simply has to be better than it has been. And you're, you're at the point of the season where you're eight games in. On some level, it is what it is. I don't know how much better you can really get, but 29 yards in a single game is never going to on that front alone nc state should feel probably a little bit lucky to exit with a win in this game because 29 yards 29 yards total in a game like just think about that for a second that's embarrassing and whether it's against cal or anyone else you cannot expect that to go out and win you a ball game so long term the answer definitely should be an increased workload for hollywood smothers i think i'd be interested to see what happens when you do give him like 20 carries see what he can do with like 20 is that going to happen? I don't know because it hasn't happened yet, but slight balance between him and Kendrick Raphael. Truth be told, I'm not sure where Jordan Waters slots into this anymore. And I know he was sick and he missed last game, but when he's been so ineffective and Hollywood Smothers is lighting it up as soon as you throw him in there, I mean, you, you get what I'm getting at here. How do you slot Jordan Waters back into this and just expect things to change? I don't know that you can. So long-term, we've preached a lot about more targets for Justin Jolie. You need a lot more carries for Hollywood Smothers. Yeah, and, and I agree with the Smothers take a 1,000%, but I also want to build upon that and say, hey, listen, this was a terrible showing for NC State on the ground. The silver lining is, while this was a terrible showing, and we've had multiple not so great showings because I believe offensively in terms of running yards or in terms of rushing yards per game, we are third from last in the conference ahead of only Florida state and Syracuse. Cal is also the third best defense. So it's a combination of both. They're good at it and we're terrible. It's not, it's not one or the other. Uh, it's a lot of both going on. here. And last one here, a little basketball talk. There was a secret scrimmage that went down on Saturday. NC State lost in this scrimmage to South Carolina by a score of 86 to 78. 
but Michael O'Connell, Mike James, and Dennis Parker Jr. did not play. Whole lot of nothing, whole lot of something. Whole lot of nothing. I never take any, I never put any stock in these secret yeah. scrimmages. Um, I didn't we lose our secret scrimmage last year? Too? Sure did. And how'd that work out for us? Yeah, I'm not really not really worried until we start putting numbers in the box scores. And even then, I think NC State has a very, very, very tough road to start this season off with. So I'm not really too worried about the secret scrimmage and even some of the early season results so much as I am as this team, can this team figure it out and gel and mush and do what and mesh and do what they need to do to, uh, you know, play good ball when it matters most, because we saw Kevin Key showed us there is in fact the time where it matters most to play your best basketball. Yeah. I'm right there with you. It's a whole lot of nothing. And these secret scrimmages, they're always a whole lot of nothing. I'll just go ahead and give y'all a heads up. They don't mean anything. A lot of times these scrimmages, they're not even real life game situations. It's called a scrimmage because it is exactly that. A lot of times coaches are even doing like almost situational drills in these scrimmages. It's not a real game. And then you factor in your point guard, Michael O'Connell did not play, who is projected to be probably your sixth man of the year. Mike James did not play. Dennis Parker Jr., who's a freshman last year, hopefully with a bigger role this year, did not play. You can't put any stock in this. And then you look ahead to NC State's regular season schedule. They have some Goliaths on their schedule coming up early in the season. I don't think you'll really get any kind of idea of who NC State basketball is. I'd say I'd say at the earliest, like the end of December. That's when you're really going to start to learn about what you have. You're not going to figure it out in mid-October. I can guarantee you that. So for this right now, secret scrimmage, it's always a whole lot of nothing. And rounding out our Tuesday show where we have Kenton's Locked On Look of the Week, rolling back the game winner that Hollywood Smothers took to the house. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. Our second Tuesday sponsor is FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. That's America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the very same page you're placing all of your bets. NC State football this weekend is on a bye, but it's going to be another electric slate of college football. Any leans you have on those games, waste no more time and head on over to FanDuel. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place just your first $5 bet. This is all happening over at FanDuel.com in order to get started. Last couple minutes here of our Tuesday show. Now time for the Locked On Look of the Week. Looking back at Hollywood Smothers taking one to the house for the win. Kenton, what do you got for us? People said this was a screen, and it was not. It was just mesh. Mesh is one of my favorite or one of my least favorite concepts as a defender. Don't let any defensive guys hear me saying that out loud. What it does is it creates a lot of havoc for both man and zone, but especially man. Mesh is a man be their supreme, okay? What it does is it stresses your defense the hell out. So what is mesh? It means that you have at least two drags coming from opposite sides of the field that are crossing each other up. Now, the reason that that's so important, the reason that that is so problematic is drag routes are one of the hardest routes to cover in man because it's not like you can read a route. As soon as the ball is snapped, you're going. You're immediately running across the field as soon as you can. Sometimes it's two drags. Sometimes it's a drag and a shallow, a very short, shallow cross. And um, in, th- in this iteration of mesh, what you have here is Keenan Jackson at the bottom of your screen running a drag, and then you have Hollywood Smothers in the backfield. We'll get to him last. But after that, you have Justin Jolie running an OTB route. That's called an over-the-ball route. Whenever you see a guy run either a what looks like a drag or what looks like they're running sharply towards the middle of the field, and then they stop directly where the center is or was. That's called an over-the-ball route. And then you have Wesley Grimes as the top of that trips, uh, or as the top of that bunch, rather. He's the point on that bunch, and he's running a shallow cross drag kind of deal there as well. KC is running the clear-out route, and Hollywood is the hot read to the flat. For those of you who don't know, a hot read means If you get blitz, you go here right away. You look here right away, which is very interesting because in mesh, 
it's kind of like everybody except your clear out and any deeper routes are, in fact, your hot reads because it's mesh. You're throwing the ball to a guy that's probably running away from somebody at full speed. Now, in order to understand why this works and how this works, you have to understand something about Cal. Cal is a very heavy man defense team. They love to say, you know what? Hey, we're going to go man for man, band for band. Who's got more? Who's got the best guys? We are going to line up one for one and we'll figure it out. But the interesting thing about this is they have multiple guys mugged up to the line of scrimmage. Both of their linebackers, instead of mugging the A-gaps as linebackers traditionally do, they instead shift the entire defensive line to the strong side of the field and bring both of the linebackers down off of the weak side of this formation. Now, here's the most interesting thing about this. The look that you look to be getting, it could be cover one, it could be cover zero, because right now you have six guys up at the line of scrimmage. And generally, not every time, but generally if you have six guys at the line of scrimmage, what you're going to see is, man, because if you're blitzing six, how many does that leave in coverage, Grayson? That's five. Okay, so if you have five, then you can go man up one for one, whatever the case may be, right? But let's just say hypothetically we're trying to time out or count out a zone, right? Now that Grayson and I have established, you have six at the line of scrimmage and only five in coverage. Let me explain to you why, generally speaking, you don't get zone out of this a lot, right, if everybody is coming. We have five guys in coverage, correct, Grayson? Correct. All right, so we're going to work out mo- all of the most popular coverages in terms of, you know, how many guys do we have to check everywhere if you are to go a zone here, right? If you got six guys blitzing, five guys in coverage, and you go cover four, that means four guys are deep. How many does that lead to check everything underneath? One. One guy. Does that – you like that deal? No. <laughs> Nobody likes that deal. So you don't run cover four when you're blitzing six. Let's go cover three now. If you go three deep and there are five guys, how many do you have to cover everything underneath? Just two. You got two guys. You'll take that deal? Nope. All right. Most people won't take that deal. Hell, let's mess around and go cover three. I'm sorry, cover two. You only got two high safety. Somehow this look is going to shift to cover two. How many guys do you have to check everything underneath? Three. You take that deal? Probably. It feels a little better, but you yeah. still, it's still not ideal to say, hey, we're trusting three guys to take away everything underneath. So you're left with cover zero and cover one. What is the difference between cover one, cover zero, and cover two, three, and four? Cover one and zero are man. Cover one and zero are man. Excellent. So what they have here is six mugged up. Now, as you can see on this screen, if you are watching, if you're listening along, I'll describe it to you. I've drawn a direct line from a defensive back to the man they are covering for every single play. Now, what Justin Wilcox and this defense wanted to do here, they wanted to confuse the freshmen. They wanted to surprise the freshman because to the untrained eye, what you see is the corner at the top with KC. There's a corner that's pressed up on the line um, against Wesley Grimes, who is uh, the the point of this bunch, who is going to be jamming him. And then you have a defensive back that's playing slightly off the line of scrimmage that is responsible for Justin Jolie on the inside. Then you have at the bottom of the screen, one corner for Keenan Jackson. You, you assume he's going to be locked on that's man. Boom. But the safety in the middle is where it gets tricky. That's where you wonder, is this cover zero and he's coming down to check Hollywood? Or is this cover one and somebody's dropping out and he's going to be the deep middle guy? You don't know. You just got to find out. But again, it's neither, Grayson. It's neither. Do you know what this is? This is a cover zero blitz. So what I have here is the outside corners are in yellow because they're exactly what you would imagine. Both of them are manned up. But that guy at the point, that guy who's right over Wesley Grimes' head, what's that arrow doing there? He's blitzing. Well, he's, he's, he's blitzing. He's coming. So what happens is the guy who looks as if he was going to be checking Joe Lee then switches to Grimes. The safety who you would imagine is either deep or checking smothers, then switches to um, Joe Lee. And what you have here is because they are blitzing seven, 
and they only have four in coverage, what happens if NC State puts five in a route, Grayson? Somebody open. Somebody is uncovered, unmolested, wide open, right? And look at that circle. Who's that circle over? Who's Mr. that red circle? Smith. Mr. Smothers standing next to his quarterback uh, so fearlessly and valiantly. Now, the blitz does what it's supposed to do. The guy comes free. The nickel comes free because nobody's there to block him. There are five guys in a route. So if you're running five guys in a route against seven guys coming, that leaves you with two unblocked. First of all, hell of a job by NC State's offensive line. But second of all, Cal, for you to somehow end up rushing seven and only having one free rusher against uh, five blockers, that's a hell of a self-check moment right there. But anywho, when Smothers, first of all, 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 uh, first of all, all our boy CJ Bailey has to do is get this ball to Smothers, period. And the first down is guaranteed. The first down is guaranteed because there is nobody within any decent modicum of space to close down and make that tackle before the first down marker. But then there's a fun thing that people don't account for. That there's really no way to account for. You know what that is, Grayson? What's that? Somebody going to be an athlete. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm an athlete. I got places to go, and I'm not really too concerned about you. You see number three here. Grayson, how many interceptions does number three have this season? Is that no Williams? That means he's got six. No Williams, and no Williams is a bad man. When, that, when you put that ball in there against him, it gets real spooky. But you know when he is not at his best? When you make him have to tackle guys like Hollywood Smothers, he's got the angle, he's got the ability, he's in front of Hollywood Smothers. But, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at the grand opening with him right in front of Hollywood Smothers. Their hips are virtually at the same place, but Hollywood has already started his cut. Grand closing, he's going to the ground. Hollywood Smothers is still running, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Grand opening, grand closing. And you would think, well, Hollywood Smothers had to cut back. And as you can see here, number 10 and 18 both look like they're in full stride. So they're going to be all right. They're going to make a tackle. No, they're not. No, they're not. That young man said, I have reservations for six. And these reservations are at Oak City Steakhouse. I am not letting you all slow me up. Have you had their filet? And so he ends up in the end zone. But I want to show something else here. Because there were points in the season where there were talks about the chemistry is bad and KC is upset and all that. And I will admit, I was one of the people to say, KC looks a little upset right now. This is at the 30-yard line before, <laughs> before Hollywood Smothers even broke the second tackle. Noel Williams is on the ground. I believe that's number 18 from Cal is attempting to make a tackle. And Grayson, what is... What is Kevin Concepcion doing with his hands up there? He's got the arms up because he knows where this ball is going. He knows that those reservations for six are about to be cashed in and we're about to eat steaks the size of our backs. And lo and behold, Hollywood gets it done. But what a play. I think it was excellently designed. I mean, you know, Wilcox sold out and said, we're going to confuse the freshman. And C.J. Bailey said, I'm poised, I'm calm, I'm under control. And would you look at that, Grayson? We have problems completing those little dump-offs underneath when there was pressure earlier in the season, and lo and behold, we can now do that. And this is what I was talking about all year long in terms of we do not need guys to be perfect in hitting 50-yard deep balls, dropping it right in the bucket. Just make the simple, basic play. Yes, there will be pressure sometimes. That is football. Make a simple, basic play and you get what you need, and that's what this team did. That'll do it for us here on Tuesday. As always, thank you all so much for joining us. Be sure to hit that like button. Drop your comments in the comment box. Tell us your thoughts on the NC State offense and how they can continue to tweak it moving forward. Tell us what you think about NC State basketball coming up, Hollywood Smothers taking the game winner to the house. Anything else you have on your mind, drop that in the box as well. Mash that subscribe button if you have not already. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Wednesday for more, and until then, Go Pack. Go Pack.